Hello from the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm Adrian Monk and welcome to Agenda Dialogues. We'll be hearing from leaders from across the world on how to build a just and equitable society post-COVID. And as many of us think about our holiday plans, we'll be looking too at how to rebuild travel and tourism. Our guests today, Nobel laureate and former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. From India, Smriti Irani, currently serving in PM Modi's cabinet as Minister of Women and Child Development. Ebru Ozdemir chairs Turkey's Limak Holding. Peter Kern is CEO of online travel company Expedia. From Kuwait, we have Hassan Al Huri, CEO of National Aviation Services. And also from India, Ajay Singh, chairman of SpiceJet. Now I'll hand over to our chair of our discussion, president of the World Economic Forum, Burger Brenda. Good afternoon from Geneva. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have an extremely strong panel today, as you just heard from my colleague, uh, Agent Monk. And we're really uh, discussing um, the fallouts of uh, this pandemic and how to make sure that the recovery is inclusive. Uh, this is a big challenge because we know that uh, there's still a lot of people in the world that uh, are not vaccinated and we know that there are new uh, strains and variants out there so uh, we can only be safe when everyone uh, are safe. We also know that uh, the recovery is on its way but uh, the 15 trillion US dollars that are used in stimulus only one percent of them have been used in developing countries. Let me uh, start uh, with uh, the largest democracy uh, in the world and second most populous uh, country in the world, uh, India. India um, did uh, well uh, at the beginning uh, of this pandemic, but has had no uh, also challenges uh, lately. Uh, I think there is no uh, light uh, in the end of uh, the tunnel, but of course we know uh, that also uh, the cabinet and Prime Minister Modi uh, is of course concerned about um, the, what it will mean when it comes to uh, inequalities and also opportunities uh, for uh, the poorer part of uh, the population. And we're so happy that Minister uh, Irani, that you were able uh, to join us. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, and also maybe you can share with us uh, now uh, faced with the challenges, uh, how will you make sure that the recovery will be inclusive and uh, how uh, do you see the situation uh, in India today? Over to you. Good evening, Bogey from the National Capital of India, Delhi. Um, you spoke in your opening remarks about the light at the end of the tunnel. Talking of lights, as of this moment, as we speak, India today has administered vaccines. Uh, close to 297 million doses, which tells you that rapidly we are reaching out to every eligible Indian over the age of 18, a vaccine provided free by the government of India so that we have our entire population protected. This pandemic has been a challenge for democracies across the world. We in India, when we talk about inequality, leverage technology right from the beginning of the office of Prime Minister Modi in 2014, recognizing that a democracy as large as ours, a demography as diverse as ours, will need the support from technology to ensure that those gaps are bridged. And that is why when the pandemic hit my country, we saw that over 200 million women who had access to a bank account for the first time in their lives had a transfer of over 300 billion rupees as economic empowerment transfer for women, especially in India due to the pandemic. We had 80 million women who received clean cooking fuel from the government because the government recognized that this support needs to continue, especially in the times where there was lockdown in the country. We had an announcement much before the pandemic hit the world uh, called Ayushman Bharat Yojana, which Mr. Singh is on board today in this dialogue, recognizes that over 100 
million families now are medically protected and covered for over 2000 illnesses across all government hospitals in our country today as we speak every district in our country has a dedicated covid hospital we as we speak today i can also proudly say today in the cabinet the prime minister announced yet again free ration for over 800 million indians and i must here add that sustained campaign of ensuring free food for 800 million indians for 15 months we allocated over 2 trillion rupees so that nobody in india sleeps on an empty stomach but the challenges as you say continue because the virus mutates the challenge is to build back better and build back equally and that is why the government <coughs> when the first wave came announced an economic package which was valued at around 10% of our gdp you also in your opening remarks spoke about the women and child development and i'm happy to share with you that when it comes to food security apart from the government announcement of food support to every indian we also had doorstep delivery of food and medicines to the house of every pregnant lactating mother in our country and every child in our country recognizing that not only economically not only medically but also socially we need to ensure that families stay together women and children stay protected we have had our helpline police services and one stop crisis service centers working 24/7 In a democracy as large as ours, given the impact of the pandemic, we recognize that there were Indians who were working across the world. You will speak of travel and tourism today on this panel. I will here highlight, and again, Mr. Singh has borne witness to the fact that India got back 9.2 million of our citizens from across the world, so that they could come back to their loved ones when the world was locking down. so the challenges yes globally are plenty but we in india under the leadership of prime minister modi are ensuring that every need of the citizen is met every challenge is met with solutions and one of the solutions that we had which was launched immediately after the pandemic hit my country was a digital application which helped in tracing of the virus across our country the arogya setu app as it's popularly known today also allows for vaccine registrations so we've had digital solutions given in this pandemic to citizens across various verticals of challenges that have been faced but we no. are committed to building back better and building back equally no thank you so much uh, for that uh, uh, overview and uh, i think we uh, also were expecting uh, quite Uh, substantial growth in india uh, this year we were expecting two digit growth and would be at uh, the fastest uh, growing economy of the larger economies uh, in the world i think uh, maybe uh, you're revising the numbers uh, now but how do you see the outlook uh, for uh, the rest of the year now when you are so uh, in a major way stepping up uh, the vaccination um i apart from the ministry of women and child development have had the privilege of serving as minister of textiles in my country and how innovative can indians get when it comes to their own manufacturing potential i saw it first hand when we in india who had never had one manufacturing unit of ppe suits managed to turn around and start 1100 companies give employment to over 500000 people 70% of them women during the lockdown and in 3 months we became the second largest exporter of ppe suits across the world and second largest exporters of n95 masks across the world now this happened because the industry and government partnered in reorienting our manufacturing capacities we had indians stepping up irrespective of the challenges to say tell us how can we help ajay singh is on on the panel this evening he's had to turn around his uh, flights as rescue operation flights so every indian has stepped up and that is why when you talk about financially how do we look at resurrecting from the pandemic i must here add that when the government talks about food security recognizing the challenges of lockdowns globally not only domestically we have ensured that we give birth to new industry verticals manufacturing verticals apart from ppe india is also now poised to become the pharmacy of the world 
We have supported over 95 countries by supply of vaccine. You know of uh, over 100 countries that receive support in hydroxychloroquine from India. And that is our commitment, that we grow strong, we grow back better, not only for India, but for the rest of the world as well. No, thank you uh, so much, uh, Minister. I think, uh, Adrian, I would like to uh, then uh, move over to you. I think uh, we're still waiting uh, for uh, President Sirleaf Johnson uh, to join us. So we'll, we'll come back uh, to the President, but we have a great uh, group here uh, to follow up on what the Minister just uh, said. And uh, several of them have also pivoted uh, during uh, the crisis, uh, their business model. We certainly do, Burger. And uh, while we're trying to get a connection into Monrovia in Liberia, um, it's a great opportunity to bring in our other panelists. And I, I want to start with um, Ebru uh, Ozdemir, because Ebru, your company, Limac yes. Holdings, you, know, you work across an incredible array of different sectors, but you know, you've been involved in building hospitals, you've been involved in building airports. How has Limac Holdings been affected by the crisis? What's been your, just give us a sense of a, a conglomerate like yours, what's been the impact of COVID on your business? Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I mean, it was a crazy one and a half years because we're active in 15 different countries with more than 50,000 employees. So basically we try to cope with the uninterrupted work uh, unfortunately, some of the airports were closed. However, it's coming back now. And uh, all the hotels were closed, but we reopened them. And we had some issues in the supply chains because we have to send a lot of uh, equipment to all these different countries. But we survived. And now the vaccinations are really moving forward. Uh, we are really more optimistic about the future. And where specifically do you see the most progress happening when you look at your business and the sectors you're involved in, the countries you're involved in? Where is bouncing back fastest? Uh, the, uh, we see the tourism, it's bouncing back very fast uh, because what we have done is in Turkey, the vaccinations were completed. We have uh, seven hotels in Turkey. We have one hotel in North Macedonia and one hotel in Northern Cyprus. So the government has given a priority for the vaccinations. And now they, we are opening up by July 1st. And suddenly the announcement came from Russia. 50 flights will land in Antalya in one day. So the hotels are now going from an empty hotels to the, um, you know, like short, uh, we'll have shortage in the rooms, in the supply. A lot of Europeans want to come as well. And of course, these are coming by the, uh, all of these are coming from through the airports. So we see a huge demand in the airports as well. And as we operate in the rules of the pandemic, we are trying to create new, uh, um, better solutions for everyone using all these hygienic uh, factors as well. We created safe, uh, certificates in the hotels and also in the airports. The same is valid for, for example, Senegal, because there's a huge diaspora who couldn't travel for the past one and a half years, and they want to come back to the country. Same valid in Pristina, the Eastern Europe as well. So the airports and the hotels, we see a huge comeback right now, but in the pleasure travel. I want to bring in on that note, Peter Kern. Peter, Expedia has an incredible um, array of offerings across the whole travel experience uh, sector. How are you seeing um, the travel sector as we look at the summer? Is it a, a massive pent up demand poised to come roaring back or is it a less um, uh, kind of a less strong kind of return to people getting into the vacation experience? Just need to unmute you, I think, there, Peter. Apologies. Zoom always gets me. Um, I was just saying, uh, I believe there's massive pent-up demand. The, uh, we're seeing it across the globe, but it is hemmed in by whatever the restrictions are for a given country. So if you think about uh, what Ebru was just discussing, when you have a channel that can open between Russia and Turkey, uh, we see terrific demand. Um, but there are many countries around the globe uh, where really you can't travel outside the country. And in some cases, it's quite restrictive still even within the country. So what we've seen, as she alluded to, is lots of uh, demand uh, 
uh, for leisure travel, for domestic travel first. Um, and then as borders open up uh, and, and corridors open up, essentially, uh, you see travel pick up. So you've seen it pick up uh, in, in Europe recently. Uh, we've seen it. It's been quite strong in the U.S. where it's picked up and where there are corridors to places like Mexico uh, and, and starting this summer, the Caribbean. So you're starting to see that. But obviously, it's still going to be uh, restricted by what governments are willing to do. The U.K. is, you know, moving backwards. Other countries have moved forwards. Then back, Japan was much better and now it's worse. You know, that's happening all over the globe. Um, so vaccines clearly, you know, are the answer. We'd like everyone to be vaccinated. We'd like to get back to, uh, you know, more normal travel patterns. But it's clear that there is, you know, huge pent up demand across the globe for people to move around. And what are the trends you're seeing? You know, we hear a lot about people exploring their own countries because of the travel restrictions, people staying home to have vacations or at least staying in their home countries. What have you been seeing from the huge amount of data that you sit on about what's happening in the travel sector? Yeah, I've, I've said all along, it's, it's pretty much what you'd expect. I mean, it is a tale of a thousand stories of different countries and different places, but people are taking the opportunity to explore domestically. Uh, certainly the kinds of leisure travel like beaches, lakes, mountains, things like that are, are most popular. Big cities have been less popular, largely because there's not that much open in big cities. Even in the U.S., uh, while big cities are, are starting to pick up, like New York and San Francisco, places like that, uh, they're trailing dramatically behind places like Miami, where there's a beach to go to, or, or the Florida coast, et cetera. So, um, and, and you see that in every country. You know, the UK is going to the coast for the summer, right? And, uh, and everybody is looking for those leisure destinations where they can take their families. We are seeing, we have seen during the pandemic, though it is reversing a little bit, uh, more interest in uh, vacation rental homes as opposed to convent, what we call conventional lodging, hotels, et cetera. But that, is, that trend is reversing somewhat now as we see not so much that vacation rentals are not strong, but uh, conventional lodging hotels are now picking up and big cities are picking up as they become safer and more things, restaurants, tourist attractions open up. Thanks, Peter. I just want to hand back to Berger for a minute. So I think we've got our line to Monrovia open and we've got um, Ellen Surley Johnson with us. Welcome, uh, President Johnson. Berger, over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, so good to see you, uh, Madam President. Uh, we uh, are so pleased that you could join us and thank you for your leadership also on the commission that you have headed uh, together uh, with uh, former Prime Minister Helen Clark uh, on behalf of the WHO, looking at uh, how did we cope with the COVID and how could, what could we learn for the future. We're still seeing major challenges out there. We know a lot of people are still waiting uh, to be vaccinated. We know that a lot of the stimulus has been allocated in to the developed uh, world and not the developing world. And we know that uh, people will be joining the group of uh, people living in extreme uh, poverty as a result of uh, the COVID. So what do you think we should do uh, and what do you expect uh, the world leaders to deliver now uh, in a G20 and G7 and the UN context moving forward. Welcome. Uh, thank you and sorry for joining late. Um, and I'm glad you started with the concern about the virus, uh, the pandemic that really has overwhelmed an unprepared world has left on full cost in human lives, lives, in livelihoods, economic growth, and at the same time comes at a time <clears throat> when we're all in the arena of the exposure of global inequities, injustices, deep-rooted racism. Um, our commission have, have uh, pointed to the fact that today the virus is still active, is still raging, and I, I don't think we all yet know the consequences 
of what this will be, or for that matter, whether the current responses will be effective enough to contain it. Uh, as you pointed out, the co-chair of the Independent uh, Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response has pointed out that there are two overarching um, action that needs to be taken globally. One is to reset the entire uh, global institutional architecture. And secondly, of course, to reform uh, the World Health Organization to make it more effective to, to carry out its mandate. Uh, whatever we do, whether it's creating, a, as we propose, a Global Health Threats Council or International Finance Facility or a global platform for the delivery of public goods such as vaccines, we come to the fact that today, if we do not stop the virus, all human lives are at risk. And the first step of vaccines, you mentioned that. But it's unacceptable that rich nations of the world who have the resources to be able to procure the vaccines from a few manufacturing companies based in the north. We have what we call vaccine nationalism, that they can continue to say they can vaccinate 100% of their population and leave the others unattended. In Africa, for example, 2% of our population is what we, we now target. Uh, but today, the global situation is, is, is even dire, even for those that have the capacity for vaccine. Only 10% of the population, the global population, according to today's record, has been vaccinated. So we can see how important it is that we address this. And I mean, we, we give recognition to a lot of response that's coming, you know, whether it's from the United States President Biden, whether it's from the European Union, those who have pledged one billion doses for delivery by 2021 or two billion do or at two billion by 2022. Um, we still know that even if we do that only, we need seven billion to get even 40% of the global population. Um, fascinated for safety. Now, on to the question that, that, that you raised about uh, social reintegration, being able to address social issues. Um, clearly, today's world will speak to that. The world has to address those inequities that have left women behind, not able to be empowered to compete, to be to take a rightful place in leadership position, particularly at high levels. Uh, to many of the youths, if we look at the young population, particularly in Africa, young population, many of them getting educated, technically prepared, but lack of available jobs for them. Those are the social inequities that we all need to find the responses to. And some of those answers lies in investment in the areas that make a difference. You cannot get jobs for the poor unless you create those businesses 
the investment in private sector, the access to private capital that enable young entrepreneurs to be able to participate in the value chain, the trade chain. Uh, and that takes a lot of commitment on the part of those countries is so easy to uh, to invest where the returns uh, are higher where the, the, the security makes it easier but there you don't touch where the real social inequities are unless one is able to change that mentality, to be able to accept risk, to be able to see the support of equity extended to all these young technical people that have creativity and ingenuity, trying their best to get knowledge, trying to access digitization to make them more competitive. What, what can one do to be able to respond to those needs. Um, I grant you that responsibility lies first with leadership. I mean, leadership of every nation, whether it's the leadership of poor nations, clearly the primary responsibility rests on their shoulders in the formulation of policies uh, in ensuring full, full participation by, by all of those. But it's also a responsibility of global leadership and the type of multilateralism that we have seen in the past that have brought through collective and coordinated action to be able to address poverty, to be able to promote those activities that will lead us to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Uh, one has seen a pullback from that into nationalism, protectionism, you know, isolationism. So the the, um, the right. challenge is going to lie to every one of us, from whatever whatever institutions we are in, wherever we, we work from. That challenge to be able to find a way forward. Uh, it's, uh, I hope that as your discussions go on, I'll stay for a little while. we thank you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for allowing me to make a few comments. I hope it resonates with some of you. And I hope that in some of your, uh, some of your remarks and, and as you go into re reflection yourselves when you leave uh, this meeting, that uh, is stay with you and you'll, you'll help us to find all the answers to meet these challenges. Thank you thank so you. much, uh, Alan uh, Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, for your leadership and also for uh, this uh, food for thought. I think this is uh, also for Adrian a great segue uh, into um, uh, the next segment uh, for you, uh, the president's uh, real um, perspective on what it will take uh, to achieve a more inclusive and fair world. Thanks very much, Burger, and uh, thanks, Madam President, for that very thoughtful uh, contribution. I think. Uh, as we look at the global economy, we're talking about a decline in the global travel and tourism sector of nearly 4 trillion euros, which is an incredible hit to the global economy. And part of recovery is not just obviously vaccination, as the president pointed out, getting people moving again. And uh, one company that is doing that uh, or helping to do that in many, many different markets is National Aviation Services, which is headquartered in Kuwait. Delighted to have Hassan El Huri with us on the line. Hassan, we're seeing an incredible range of different measures being put in place to uh, control travel, to control the epidemic, um, but also quite a confusing number of regulations. How is someone like you who operate uh, airports around the world, how are you and your staff dealing with that confusion? How are you navigating through it? Thank you, Adrian. Um, thank you to the WEF as well for having me on this, on this wonderful panel. Uh, to answer that question, I want to go back to the 1950s. 
The reason the 1950s is important for aviation is because it was during that time when English was adopted as the official language of travel, of aviation, of airlines, pilots, air traffic control, and everything related to aviation. That came as a result of a very tragic accident, which included air traffic control and two aircraft, which were not able to communicate effectively with one another. I think we are seeing a repeat of that in 2020. What we have is a mosaic of different policies, procedures, government regulations. You have seven week, seven day quarantine, you have 14 day quarantine, you have quarantine at home, quarantine in a hotel, PCR test before arrival, uh, before departure, sorry, after arrival, rapid tests, vaccines, one vaccine, two doses. And you have this entire mosaic, which nobody is really able to decipher. And that is really discouraging travel. People like to plan their travel in advance, and they just can't do that with this, you know, hodgepodge of different policies and procedures and government regulations. I think as, as the stakeholders of travel and tourism, I think we failed miserably last year to bring all of these, these policies together, to create a global platform where you know, people can, can understand what is required and expected of them so that they can travel. I think we did very well on the science side. We got, I think we, we got an A plus for coming out with the vaccine in a record time. And I think we've vaccinated a lot of people, at least in rich countries. And, you know, that's great. I think we need to do much better um, with regards to developing countries where one in 500 people are vaccinated, which I think is, is embarrassing, but that's a different subject. So I think the stakeholders of, of travel and tourism failed miserably in repeating the success that we've had since the 1950s, where we adopted English, uh, machine-readable passports, visas, different check-in systems all over the world that can speak to one another. We need a repeat of that in, in, in 2020. One of the things that we did, and you know, our company, uh, NAS, is the largest airport services company in emerging markets, particularly strong in Africa, what we've done is we developed a system for the Kuwaiti government where we connected labs within Kuwait and labs overseas to the airports using blockchain and biometric uh, verification. Of course, with the full consent of the passenger, we're able to test people in labs that we've, we've, we've audited and confirmed. We know what the standards are. And people can then travel comfortably when they're flying into Kuwait. We've also linked the, the vaccine database of, of Kuwait to the airport, and now we're working with international organizations to connect that, that vaccine database overseas so people living in Kuwait can travel overseas comfortably using their vaccine uh, passport, if you will. So these are some of the things we've done to kind of resuscitate the travel and tourism industry, which across the world, you know, provides employment for more than 300 million people. Mm. Uh, Hassan, we saw after 9-11 an incredible array of security procedures brought into airline travel. Those procedures have stayed with us. Do you anticipate some of the measures we're seeing now in dealing with the pandemic staying as part of the travel uh, process moving forward? Or are you optimistic that perhaps this can be something that only stays in place for the duration of the epidemic? So I think, Adrian, before 9-11, uh, airport services was built on quality and safety. Those were the two things that everybody spoke about. After 9-11, we added a third pillar, which is security. You know, so you said safety, security, and quality, very important. I think now after COVID, we've added, we're adding a fourth one, which is health. Traveling across you know, Africa and other parts of the world, we used to have the yellow fever um, the little yellow book for, for you know, yellow fever, which you would show at the, at the airport. And nobody really knows, is it a forged uh, document? Is it valid? They kind of just look at, you know, your, the, the document, if you have it, they never really pay real attention to it. What I think is going to happen, and I hope happens, is that we have a digital um, passport, if you will, that is recognized globally. And whereas, you know, airport officials can verify that A, the, the certificate that you present is authentic. You are the rightful owner of that certificate. You've given your consent to the airport official to have a look at that uh, certificate and that it's, the certificate is, 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 is checking 
the things that the airport official actually wants to check. So is it whether it's COVID, yellow fever, any other diseases, any other diseases that might arise in the future, it needs to be digital and it needs to be one that is a platform globally that all of these systems talk to. Mm. Thanks, Hassan. I, I want to bring the minister back in, if I may. And, and minister, I know your brief doesn't extend to travel, but we heard uh, there from Hassan and we've also heard from our, our other panelists about the sheer complexity of the, the different ways that governments have responded. And obviously the challenge has been enormous for governments. And, you know, one can only, um, you know, step back and, and uh, admire the way in which they've risen to the challenge. But on this issue of coordination, is that something you and your colleagues are talking about as, as perhaps the next step in dealing with the crisis of, of international coordination, working with companies to try and put in place some of the measures that we're hearing need to be established to, for us to move forward? I think, Adrian, we are putting uh, citizen safety first. Given that the virus is mutating across the world and just when people presume, as Peter in his opening remarks had said, just when people presume that the situation normalizes in one country, it erupts yet again. Governments across the world, I can't speak for them, but I can especially speak for mine. We will prioritize citizens' health security first. We will ensure that we work with governments across the world, but yes, prioritize health security. Uh, mm. But I also must here say that uh, the government is working actively with the industry to find solutions, be it economic or for that matter, logistically. But uh, domestically, I think we are uh, currently looking at operations which are completely open. However, I understand the international constraints in which all governments are working given uh, till such time that every global citizen is not vaccinated. I think these challenges will continue to erupt and they will have to be met with solutions which are timely, but solutions that are globally acceptable. No, thanks for that, Minister. Um, staying with India, I want to bring in Ajay Singh, who's uh, chair of, of, Vice, of SpiceJet. Um, Ajay, how have SpiceJet been coping in, in the current circumstances? Um, we've heard about the difficulties, we've heard about the problems of, of keeping people moving and of the overwhelming need to secure people's safety. But what's been the impact on a major carrier like yourselves? Uh, well, uh, Peter, as uh, some of the participants have said, of course, this crisis has been absolutely devastating for the aviation and travel and tourism uh, industry. But as uh, Borgia was saying in his opening remarks, uh, uh, you know, it's given an opportunity to airlines like ours to try and pivot uh, to new forms of business uh, and try and find a way in which as corporations, we can contribute to the larger effort of our nation uh, of keeping people safe. Uh, as uh, our minister, Minister Irani was saying uh, in her remarks, uh, I think uh, what uh, SpiceJet has tried to do is to uh, actually assist in the national effort of getting our people back to our country. Uh, she spoke of the 9 million people uh, that the government of India got back uh, to their homes. Uh, and we are proud to have contributed significantly uh, to, to that effort. Uh, we also realized that uh, what our country would need uh, would be, uh, you know, medicines and medical equipment and, uh, uh, you know, PPE suits and uh, such uh, things which, which would help the fight uh, uh, with COVID. And uh, SpiceJet quickly pivoted and built a, a large cargo business, uh, which uh, was basically uh, and initially built uh, to uh, serve our country uh, and now has uh, become a, a pretty significant business. I mean, it's grown uh, six times from where it started. Uh, and the government has uh, actually actively supported uh, this pivot uh, by providing uh, policy uh, directions uh, in, in such a way that uh, there is suddenly this whole new industry which has uh, uh, been built up in India, where Indians finally and Indian carriers finally are taking India's cargo uh, across India and throughout the world. Uh, this, this was really the preserve of, uh, of airlines outside India. And uh, this crisis taught us that we could actually do this uh, ourselves. 
the, the other pivot for SpiceJet has been its foray into uh, the space of health. Uh, we realized that uh, uh, testing, uh, this, this RT-PCR testing for COVID was, was extremely expensive in our country. It was around, you know, a test would cost about $25. Uh, and we set about to uh, to uh, to to bring that cost down, and we actually brought it down to less than four dollars, uh, and and that made testing much more available uh, for for our country. Uh, we also built an innovative model where we took these mobile labs. We said, look, uh, you know, in 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 so many ways, Indians find it hard to reach testing centers, uh, and so we took the testing centers to them. Uh, and that again is a is a business which was built out of the necessity of COVID and is doing exceedingly well. We are using the same model now for vaccination. Uh, so I think I think many positives have come out of uh, this problem, and uh, and uh, uh, we are proud to contribute, uh, uh, you know, uh, to to our government's uh, massive effort uh, at saving its own people. Actually, I know you can't speak for the entire industry, but can you give us a sense of how quickly? a carrier like you can bounce back and get to the back if we move forward in vaccination, if we move forward in protecting people. What is the lag time between someone uh, running a business like yours, getting pilots, getting air crew, getting routes, getting planes back into service to something near the levels that we were seeing before the pandemic? What is the timeline? Is it months? Is it years? Can you give uh, people on the call an idea? You know, uh, at least I can speak for at least the Indian carriers, and Indians are very innovative uh, people. Uh, they move fast. We, we've seen this happen, uh, you know, uh, pre-COVID, we were flying about 400,000 passengers every day uh, domestically. Uh, and uh, then there was a complete shutdown. We went to zero. Uh, in March uh, of 2020, uh, the Prime Minister of India decided that there would be a complete shutdown, which probably saved this country, uh, you know, in that first COVID wave. Uh, so we were shut for two months and uh, then we started again in May uh, and we uh, started bouncing back really quickly. We, we went from zero to 300,000 uh, in the space of the next few months. Uh, then of course, the second COVID wave hit, hit us and we went back to 40,000 uh, passengers a day. We are now back to 120,000 passengers a day. And I have no doubt uh, that, of course, uh, safety being the highest priority, as soon as we are allowed to fly more, uh, you will find that uh, the Indian carriers will bounce back really, really uh, quickly. Uh, in fact, it, I, I won't even say that it would take months. It would just take weeks uh, for us to do it. We are all set and ready to go. Thanks for that. Can I come back, Peter, to ask you, as we look forward to this summer, I just wanted to get a sense. Do you feel that the travel changes that we've seen in the last 18 months have structurally changed uh, parts of the industry and also changed permanently some consumer tastes? Or are we simply seeing a period of repression of uh, global demand, of global uh, interest in travel because of the pandemic that will come back to what we thought of as normal before? Yeah, I, I think, Adrian, that uh, and I've said publicly that I, that we believe travel is going to come back more or less like it was. I think, as AJ uh, suggested, uh, it's going to come roaring back. When people can travel, they will travel. Uh, and while we believe that there may have been some adoption during the period, uh, you know, people trying vacation rentals, people trying other forms of travel in the U.S., camping and RVs became quite popular. I'm sure that's true in Europe as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we believe it will go back Broadly, people still go to Paris and Rome and Singapore and Shanghai, et cetera. So I, I think, um, you know, in general, none of this is structural. And uh, as everybody's alluded to today, I think uh, we expect it will come back essentially how it was, but stronger because of the pent up demand. And, and just to refer to a couple of the comments uh, and Hassan referred to this integration and working together of, of the foreign governments uh, or the world's governments, I think it's true. You know, everybody was focused first on securing their safety of their people. Uh, even in the U.S., it is clear that that is still uh, our main focus, and, and the industry is working with government to try to get more involved with other governments, to try to align, as Hassan said, around standards of, you know, global passports, et cetera. But it is not anywhere yet, really, and there's a long way to go on that. So I think, uh, you know, the shortest distance between us and back to normal is getting the world vaccinated. There's no question. 
Uh, I happen to believe that's probably faster than getting the world's governments to cooperate on a single digital standard. But um, maybe I'm maybe I'm being pessimistic on that. Uh, but I think uh, everything suggests that when they're vaccinated, people return to their habits, the things they love, the places they love to go. Peter, thank you. I want to draw our conversation to a close, but I just want to give a last word to each of our, our panelists. Um, if I can start, Ebru, with you, what are your what are you anticipating as we look at this summer, as people in the in the uh, northern hemisphere start making their plans? What are you seeing? Are you seeing uh, you know a beginning of a return to something like the situation of of twenty nineteen? Um, first of all, I think people are more help, more hopeful. And in Turkey, we already have the vaccination identities right now, and it's on digital. And currently, we are vaccinating like more than one million people. And for this reason, we are very hopeful about tourism, and because we are fully dependent on also tourism. And I was in U.S. People want to go. People want to travel. So pleasure travelers, we see already in the airports. As uh, I totally agree with Peter, but this is, of course, dependent on the destinations that are open. I mean, some of the destinations are unfortunately closed, but Turkey is open, so we are seeing more tourists. And people definitely miss to, uh, to travel on pleasure, pleasure-wise. However, in business-wise, I don't see that the travel will come back as soon as we expect. Everybody like this, we are so much dependent on Zoom now and digitally we make meetings. I went to Korea for one hour. I traveled from Turkey 11 hours. I don't think I'm gonna do that again. Or in the hotels, we used to make big meetings with conferences, gatherings. I don't think these will come back any sooner, but it will be more family travelers, pleasure travelers having hotel, having holidays by the sea. So basically everybody will travel on the pleasure side, business, will wait. So the, we are changing our strategy in the hotels to more um, the sports kind of things. Like we are doing like triathlons, tennis, cycling. So all these people would like to come together to jointly to make for sports events. So basically I think uh, everybody missed to travel. So we expect to see a lot of tourists traveling around, but no business yet. No business. Hassan, is that something you're, you're thinking too, that we'll see a return to people wanting to travel for family reasons, to see loved ones that they haven't been able to connect with for months, uh, and also just to, to leave the places they've been stuck in for a long time, but that we won't see perhaps the immediate bounce back of business travel? What I, what I think we're going to see is two things. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of domestic travel. So people traveling within the U.S. or, you know, within Europe or within Turkey, for example. And I think with the developed countries or the quote-unquote rich countries, people who are vaccinated are comfortable to travel. However, I think with regards to developing countries where vaccine rollout has been much, much slower, I think people are traveling out of necessity or out of apathy. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people have just raised their hands up and said, we can't deal with this anymore. We need to travel vaccinated or not. We're going on holiday. We're going to travel for business or we're going to go and travel and see our parents, our kids, our cousins, whatever it is. So I think these are the two different kind of, if you will, pillars that we'll see. And Ajay, you talked about pivoting to cargo. You know, do you see business travel coming back in the same way? Um, that we've heard from uh, from Ebru and from Hassan uh, in a more limited way and that you'll be taking a lot more stuff and fewer humans uh, in the near to distant future? Or do you, are you a bit more optimistic about the business uh, perspective? No, I think uh, I agree with the, uh, both Hassan and Ebru uh, that uh, business travel uh, would, would be the slowest uh, to come back. Uh, but as you know, India has a, has a very significant uh, domestic market. We have 1.3 billion people uh, and uh, we all love to travel. Uh, and we suddenly discovered India. Uh, you know, uh, for, for, for so many of us, uh, we didn't know how beautiful our country really was. And, and uh, we are getting a, a, a glimpse of that. And so domestic travel will pick up. Remember that India is also the country which makes the largest number of vaccines in the world. Uh, 
you know, Minister Irani spoke about the 270 million uh, vaccines administered. Uh, the government has an, a really ambitious plan to vac vaccinate 10 million uh, Indians every day. We vaccinated 8 million people just day before yesterday. Uh, so I'm very hopeful that uh, we will, uh, vaccination will pick up pace uh, and Indians will discover India and we will have a lot of uh, uh, domestic travel uh, within India. And of course, international travel, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Minister, that seems like a great cue to give you the last word on our discussion today. And you, we began by talking about some of the issues around equity and the vaccine. We heard from President Sirleaf Johnson about the issue of vaccine nationalism. But on a more positive note, we're also talking about internationalism, about getting people back, moving around this great world of ours and actually restoring one of the great industries um, of the global economy, which is travel and tourism. What's your takeaway to panelists and the people watching this afternoon? Adrian, in India, many of us say, Umid pe dunya kaim hai, which is that the world exists and persists to exist on hope. And as somebody who has traveled well on Ajay Singh's airline with my family, Yes, I will support what he says, that we in India are rediscovering uh, our uniqueness in the travel circuit. But we hope to be global travelers yet again. Uh, but uh, like I said, prioritizing the security and safety and health of global citizens, ensuring that every global citizen, at least in India, we have ensured that every Indian eligible for the vaccine is vaccinated. Uh, I just spoke about 8 million Indians today, like I said, as we speak, 297 million doses have been given to Indian citizens across our country. Uh, we also, since you spoke about equity in building back better, we can today say as Indians proudly so that apart from cash transfers to 200 million Indian women, I was proud to see that 176 million Indian women received collateral free working capital before the pandemic. And during the pandemic to help women, especially who are in the SME segment, the government announced a scheme called Swanidhi, which is particularly directed at street vendors, apart from big industry support that the government announced. And uh, happily so, I share today that of the 3 million uh, people who applied for these loans, 41% of the beneficiaries, again, were Indian women. So we are, like I said, committed to building back better, not only for India, but for the world. Uh, we in India set a, in, an example, as Ajay said, we pivoted on many of our industry segments, be it airlines, be it the manufacturing of PPE, or for that matter, becoming the pharmacy of the world. We stay committed not only for the well-being of India, but also nations across the world. Minister and all of our panelists, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and for sharing your insights on uh, the global bounce back of what we hope is going to be a return for one of the world's great industries. Thanks everyone for watching.